If you want to climb out of any rank, diamond and below, then I'm here to tell you, 80 carry is the worst possible role to do that with. Here's the twist though, it's not for the reasons you think it is. It's actually because every 80 carry, they make the exact same mistake that holds them back from climbing and actually carrying. In this guide, you're going to learn what that mistake is and how you can fix it. I can guarantee that if you implement what you're about to learn, that you'll climb a full rank. Now, before we teach you how to fix the problem though, we should probably explain to you what the problem actually is. You see, as AD carry, you have the least control over the outcome of the early game. If you instead played an actual role, like top, jungle, or mid lane, it would mainly just be you against the opponent. The early game would be an opportunity to use your skill advantage to acquire an early lead on the enemy team. You could then use that early lead to become an absolute monster and snowball the rest of the game. As an 80 carry though, you can take that whole concept and throw it right out the window. It doesn't matter if you're the Korean pro Gumayushi. When you queue as 80 carry in low elo, the kind of supports you get will kiss any chance of an early lead goodbye. Well, at least any chance of consistently getting an early lead. Now, don't get me wrong, you will get early leads when you get the better support, but for the most part, it will feel quite random and out of your control. The problem, it doesn't just stop here though. You see, most other roles actually dislike big team fights. Imagine top lane champions like Darius, Fiora, and Garen. They excel in small skirmishes or 1v1s. Jungle is the same idea. Kane, Kha'Zix, Elise. The list goes on. A lot of champions that prefer to take on one opponent and keep the fights relatively small in size. This makes them strong champions in solo queue for this reason, and it's actually a very important concept when it comes to carrying in solo queue in general. It is the concept of agency. You want to be able to have control over the outcome of not only the game, but the fights that happen within the game. The more players you add to a team fight, the less agency you have on the outcome of that team fight, as you add more variables that can go wrong. And so you're probably starting to see the problem. Traditionally, AD carries have been considered champions that excel in a traditional 5v5 team fight setting, where they will output high damage per second. But that's the exact type of fight we want to avoid in low elo solo queue. We will just add a ton of variants where teammates will misplay and the outcome will be out of your control. This is why ADC sucks at carrying in low elo. You won't have control over the early game to set up a consistent lead and snowball since you're restricted based on the skill of your support player. And at the same time, even if you get a lead, you'll be trying to push that lead through grouping scenarios with teamfights with a high number of players, giving you even less control over the outcome of the game. This is why you need to stop playing AD carry, well, like an AD carry. In this guide, I'm going to teach you a macro strategy you need to be using if you want any hope of climbing through low elo. I'll even be giving you a tier list of AD carry champions that work best with this strategy at the end of this guide, so make sure to watch until the end. And if all of that wasn't enough, on our website we actually created an entire course to be paired alongside this guide. We sent out real players just like you to try out this strategy you're about to learn in silver, gold, platinum, and diamond. We then reviewed their replays and went over the exact mistakes they were making when trying to execute this strategy. It doesn't stop there though, as we also sent our challenger expert into low elo to not only prove this strategy works with the absolute worst teammates imaginable, but to then teach and break down exactly how he does it in his own games. So if you end up finding this guide useful, and trust me, you will, then you need to unlock the full course by clicking that discount link in the description below. All right, enough hype. What is the strategy that will save you from the depths of elo hell? Well, let's jump into a replay of mine to find out. So in this game, I'm playing Vayne with a new new support in around high gold to low platinum. As I'm sure you've all experienced in your own games, it turns out the new new support wasn't the right pick. He spent the majority of the early laning phase using his snowball to, well, do a whole lot of nothing. Well, that's not entirely true. He does seem to be speedrunning, feeding the enemy team. Needless to say, I had no chance of winning this lane, no matter how well I played it. In fact, by the time the enemy takes my tower, I'm down nearly 2,000 gold on the enemy AD carry. At this point, if you play ADC the traditional way, the game is over, you're too far behind, and will have no way of impacting teamfights. However, I want you to stop thinking of yourself as an AD carry, and instead, imagine you are playing a split pusher, like Trindamere top. Whenever you find yourself making a decision on where to go on the map, I want you to ask yourself, what would Trindamere do? He's going to be our guiding light to carrying out of the depths of low elo. So, my tower has fallen, I'm 2000 gold behind, and we see the enemy bot lane grouping to pressure the mid tower. This is where every 80 carry makes the exact same mistake. They try rotating mid and help defend the mid tower, effectively trying to match the enemy bot lane. This is entirely wrong and why you're losing as 80 carry. If you do that, you'll just be stuck in a loop, trying to hold off the enemy's pushes, which will inevitably cause teamfights to occur around those pushes. 
With a high number of players in those fights, and you're behind in gold, yeah, probably sounds all too familiar. The outcome will be you seeing the defeat screen. Say it with me now. We are not an AD carry anymore. We are Trinimir, a split pushing top laner. And so we should be, well, split pushing. And as we get to this tower, this is a perfect time to explain why this strategy works so well. You see, when you split push, you force a response from the opponent. They have to send at least one person to defend your push to stop you from taking the tower. Immediately, you're proactively asking the enemy a question of, do you know how to defend this? If they don't and send no one, well, that's free farm for you and a free tower. That already sounds a lot more appealing than being on the back foot and trying to defend pushes from the fed enemy bot lane, right? Well, here's what's really crazy. If we replay that clip, it really didn't look like that big of a deal. I mean, I just pushed out some minions, the enemy didn't react, and then I got a tower. And yeah, that's what the enemy thinks too. In reality, getting four minion waves and a tower just cut that 2,000 gold lead the enemy 80 carry had to only 1,000. Yeah, this strategy is that effective, and not to mention, it really only took us a minute. Now, you may be thinking, great, so let's just keep that split push going. Well, unfortunately, nothing in League of Legends is that simple. In order to properly execute this strategy, you will need to be aware of where enemies are on the map. Notice how at the start of this clip, we saw Olaf top. We then saw Malzahar mid. And then shortly after, the enemy Varus and Nautilus mid. This let us know that it's safe to split push as only the enemy Akshan is missing. And if we take a look topside, we can also see our Trinomir is pushing as well. Akshan will have to choose between going top lane or bot lane, leaving one of the lanes vulnerable. We then see him top, so now we know where everyone is and we're safe to keep pushing and take the tower. Notice shortly after though, when we destroy that tower, the entire enemy team is now missing. At the same time, our team isn't pressuring anything anymore. Two teammates are in base and Trindamir is dead. It's important to understand how this looks from the enemy's perspective. Players in solo queue are often like moths attracted to light. Right now, you're basically sending out a giant bat signal saying, please kill me, I'm overextended. And none of your teammates are sending out any of their own lights. Naturally, the enemy moths, I mean players, will flock towards you. That's why I know it's time for me to recall, to spend my gold and to reset. As we leave the base, remember our motto, what would Trindamir do? So I begin heading straight back into my split push. I'm doing a few things along the way though. First, I'm watching the minimap and tracking where the enemy players are so I know how risky my split push will be. I'm also looking for nearby resources I can farm along the way. This is something split pushers in top lane absolutely love to do, is take jungle camps in between waves to get even more fed. So, I spot Varus and Nautilus mid lane, and then I spot Akshan top. That leaves Olaf and Malzahar alive and missing on the map, both who can easily kill me 1v1 right now. Additionally, notice how my wave bot side is also super pushed up. The closer to the enemy side of the map a wave is, the more dangerous it is to be there. So I just use this time to farm jungle camps, so I'm still generating gold and experience for myself. We then spot Malzahar mid, and shortly after, Olaf mid. Great, so I should head back bot lane and begin my split push again, right? Well, not so fast. Let me show you some tricks that you'll find extremely useful when split pushing. First is try to anticipate where the next objective is going to be. In this case, we can see on the minimap Dragon is spawning soon. Dragon is like a giant magnet for low elo players. It's the ultimate flame for the moths. By the time I get bot to start pushing, chances are the enemy team will be heading towards bot lane to set up for that spawning dragon. Next, try to pay attention to body language. We actually saw the enemy team head towards the bot side of the map as we lost vision of them. Again, this indicates they'll likely just collapse on me if I push bot at this moment. And lastly, pay attention to your teammates' pressure on the map. Remember, the enemy team are moths role-playing as humans. From the enemy's perspective, they don't see anyone on the map. If we showed bot right now, we're casting a giant light and they will immediately try to collapse on us. This is why I know to hold off on splitting for the moment and just take what farm I can nearby. In this case, it's a raptor camp. So now the dragon has spawned and the dragon dance occurs, and well, I want to act like my legs are broken. Big team fights around dragon while behind, that's a big no if you actually want to climb. Instead, I want to use this as a distraction, an opportunity for me to headbot and farm the wave now that it's been pushed all the way to my side of the map. As I push, I still make sure to keep tabs on the enemy team. I see them all chasing my teammates, and so I'm safe to keep split pushing. And here, I probably do something that a lot of you guys think is crazy, but I actually continue to push the next wave despite the enemy team being right beside me at Dragon. Here's the trick, you need to look at your team's pressure. Trindamir is pressuring top and Vex is pressuring mid. If I also pressure bot, it will force the enemy team to have to send the right amount of people to each one of these lanes to defend them, which will just simply never happen in solo queue. They instead send people to try and defend top and mid towers, and so again, I'm free farming in my side lane. Keep in mind though, if they did send people down towards me to kill me, well, that's fine. That's free mid and top towers for our team, which is a net win for us. 
Now, fortunately, there's more we can do than just simply push and try to take towers with this strategy. After all, if you're behind like I am, it's not exactly like you can 1v1 opponents at this point in time if they do come to defend. You need to be aware that when you push out a lane, you'll often be in a good position to rotate from that push to then flank the enemy and collapse on a fight towards the center of the map. In this case, I saw them send Malzahar and Akshan to defend top, and Olaf and Nautilus were low in health in mid lane. On top of all of this, when you push a wave and it finally gets to the enemy's tower, there's a good chance someone will show up to pick up that wave and defend the tower from being destroyed. This is how I knew it was the right choice to go for the kills mid on the low health enemies instead of continuing to try and push bot lane where Varus would just defend it. I'm able to pick up a kill and I want to emphasize a very important concept when it comes to implementing this split push strategy as an AD carry. Let's go back a bit to when I first pushed that wave to the tower. In these spots, you need to know what your next move is if the opponent defends. You don't want to be wasting time getting no resources, walking back and forth, or recalling when you shouldn't have to. In this case, if there was no fight to collapse on in mid lane, well, I could take the enemy's blue buff, or I could recall and then take my team's red buff. The idea is I push the wave, now I have time to work with while I wait for the wave to be pushed back to my side of the map. This is why once I get this kill on mid, I immediately start taking the wolf camp. I know that I don't need to head bot lane yet as the wave isn't pushed to my side of the map. In fact, I'm even able to take the entire rest of the jungle. You always want to be generating additional golden experience in between your split pushes while you wait for that wave to bounce back. That's how you're going to get ahead. Now, I have the wave waiting for me safely on my side of the map and I've spent my gold, so I'm even stronger. As we leave base, you still need to be tracking where the enemies are though. We see Malzahar at Baron and Varus and Nautilus mid. However, by the time I get to the bot wave, I only see Nautilus at Baron. Everyone else is missing. We even saw the Scryer's Bloom activate on the minimap near our Raptors, indicating someone could be collapsing on us. So why on earth did I choose to keep pushing in this situation? Well, again, it's about our team's pressure. Our Trinimir has a lot of pressure being pushed decently far topside. Additionally, all four of my teammates are grouped close to Baron. If the enemy sends multiple people towards me, I can try to waste their time for as long as possible to set up my team to take Baron or Trinimir to take the inhibitor top. You need to be comfortable sacrificing your life if your team is in position to take things off it. Pay attention to what your teammates are pressuring and ask yourself, if the enemy collapses on me, will that allow my team to take something? If the answer is yes, you know you can keep pressuring. In this case, they only send Malzahar to defend my push. Now, I want you to remember earlier, when they sent Varus to defend my push and we rotated off and collapsed on the low health enemies in mid lane. Well, in this case, my team got a pick on Nautilus at Baron. Now that Malzahar is bought, I immediately rotate off and call for us to do Baron. This is a very powerful concept when it comes to split pushing. When the enemy moves to defend your push, you can actually rotate off while they're distracted, killing the minion wave you just shoved into them. This will allow you to get to fights or areas of the map before them. This is commonly referred to as having a tempo advantage. I then use both the number advantage we have from the Nautilus dying and the tempo advantage I have on Malzahar to try and take the Baron. Keep in mind, even if the enemy reacts here and tries to fight us, it is a 5v4 in our favor since Nautilus is dead. Those are good numbers. Now you might be thinking, wow, Baron buff, so you now finally group with your team and siege a tower and end the game, right? Absolutely not. Remember our motto, what would Trindamir do? If we group with our team and siege, a 5v5 teamfight will break out, which again, gives us low agency and is what we want to avoid. That's how you throw games as an AD carry. We want to be the ones in control of the outcome of the game. We want to be in the driver's seat, not just a passenger. So we start out split pushing bot side and spot a teamfight breakout in mid lane just as predicted. My team loses it and the extremely balanced passive on Akshan respawns the entire enemy team. Now, usually in this scenario, I would just keep split pushing. After all, we knew the entire enemy team was mid, but as soon as Akshan's passive respawns the enemy team, I know that like moths to a flame, they will gun straight for me to defend my push. However, that's why we use our trusty other tool, the collapse off the push. This lets me clean up the teamfight and kill both Malzahar and Akshan. Hopefully, you're starting to see the pattern. We split push, and if the enemy doesn't send someone to defend, great, that's free farm and towers for us. If the enemy does defend, great, we just rotate off and look to either collapse on winning fights or take jungle camps. Oh yeah, it's also worth noting, after this kill, I'm now 1000 gold and 3 levels ahead of the enemy Varus. Yeah, that's what he gets for trying to play AD carry the traditional way. And I wouldn't be surprised if by this point, some of you are pulling your hair out, wondering if I'll ever teamfight. Well, there are some moments where you can teamfight. You just need to make sure you have a big advantage. For example, in this case, two enemies are dead, and there's two taking dragon, one of them being a support. If I collapse, it will be a 3v2 in our favor, which will easily win. So naturally, it's perfectly fine to teamfight in scenarios like these, where the outcome is practically guaranteed to be good for you. 
And if at this point you're still thinking, okay, great, now we group with the team and push an end. Well, then you're still thinking way too much like an AD carry. This is the beauty of this strategy, is that by splitting, we're not only gaining a ton of gold, but also solo experience. In fact, I'm the highest level champion in the entire game at level 16. And don't get me wrong, I could group with my team if they were ahead as well and we could easily win the game. But when you're really the only one with a lead on your team, like I am in this game, you want to keep splitting. After enough time passes, you'll eventually get to the point where no one can match you in the split push, as you're way too strong. And that's when the enemy team is truly screwed. Alright, so as you can tell, this macro strategy is great to use to carry low elo. But we'll be honest with you, there are definitely certain champions that are better at it than others. That's why we created a tier list of champions for this strategy. In the OP tier, you'll find Tristana and Vayne. Both of these champions have innate scaling, which is great, as with the strategy, you'll be able to stall out the game and scale really well as you split push. At the same time, they have great mobility and self-peel, which makes either 1v1ing or escaping way easier if someone tries to match you in your push. In the S tier, we have Draven and Kai'Sa. Draven is very strong at 1v1ing while having mobility to kite, and Kai'Sa has great scaling with mobility as well, making them great at this strategy. In the A tier, we have Lucian, Misfortune, Sivir, Ezreal, Samira, Zeri, Kalista, and Twitch. The majority of the AD carry roster falls into the A tier. They're still all great at executing this strategy, but their champions either have weaker scaling or 1v1 potential than the ones ranked above them. In the B tier, we have Zaya, Aphelios, and Caitlyn. These champions are pretty average at the strategy, mainly due to either a lack of mobility, scaling, 1v1 potential, or a mixture of the three. And lastly, we have the C tier, where you'll find Kogma, Ash, Jinx, and Jin. These are champions with a severe lack of mobility and so are unable to outplay in the 1v1 or escape being collapsed on. Or they simply lack that DPS needed to 1v1 tank your top lane champions that will try to defend against your pushes. And if this hard carry playstyle is something you want to learn, then you need to unlock the full course at our website skillcap.com. We sent out real players just like you to try out this strategy in silver, gold, platinum, and diamond. We then reviewed their replays and went over the exact mistakes they were making when trying to execute the strategy. It doesn't stop there though, as we also sent our challenger expert into low elo to not only prove this strategy works with the absolute worst teammates imaginable, but to then teach and break down exactly how he does it in his own games. So what are you waiting for? Learn to start carrying your games and click the discount link in the description below. All right, and that will do it for this guide. We hope you guys learned a lot. Best of luck on Summoner's Rift, and we'll catch you in the next one.